Mississippi, America's mightiest river. For a while it seemed as if it had been forgotten, as if Old Man River was just a distant myth. But America is rediscovering the Mississippi as a source of its music, its culture and its lifestyle, as the home of Elvis Presley and Mark Twain. The journey on and along the Mississippi takes us into the soul of this vast country. Memphis, Tennessee the biggest city on the Mississippi. Union Street has hardly changed since July 5th, 1954, the day this street became a mecca for music fans. And Sun Studio is still there. This is where a young truck driver and his band from nearby Tupelo, Mississippi were heading that fateful day. Elvis Presley and his buddies had a meeting with the studio's boss, Sam Phillips. James Lott is the present-day recording engineer at Sun Studio, but he can relate the story of that night as if he had been there himself. During a break, after hours of recordings that were going nowhere, Elvis began improvising a traditional melody he had picked up from black musicians in his neighborhood. And when they started doing it, Elvis just started out with a big chord. And Scotty put a kind of a rolling uh, guitar part. Well, that's all right, mama, that's all right for you, that's all right, mama, any way you do, that's all right. And Sam stopped what he was doing, opened that door over there and said, ho, 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 you guys back that up and I'm going to start rolling the tape because this is something I dig. Now you're on to something. And that's how the, the song got started. Well, that's all right, mama. Elvis Presley's meteoric rise to fame began that day. This was the big bang of rock and roll. And its echo continues to draw musicians from all over the world to Memphis. The Cadillac band from Sweden has traveled 10,000 kilometers to get to Memphis. These rock and roll veterans have now reached their destination. Some even saw Elvis live on stage. For 50 years, rock and roll has been their business and their lives. And they say that there's no better place for it than Memphis. And Beale Street. One bar after another, and they all have live music. This street has long been a springboard for new careers and a final stop for broken dreams. Having just arrived, the Swedish rockers begin fine-tuning their set list for the evening's show. We will try to do a little bit of everything. Uh, we will do a little bit of Elvis, a little bit uh, Rick and Elvis, Rick and a little bit of uh, some ballads, uh, a little bit of old-time music that we are playing on the uh, maybe and do some dinner song. Yeah, rock and roll as well. And one blues. And one blues. So it will be a, a total mix-up. So this is a dream come true. A ever since I was a baby and uh, listened to the music and Elvis and rockabilly and everything. This is this is so great. A mission. A mission in Memphis. For me to be here, it's overwhelming. So uh, this is the thing. This is it. This is where it all began. And then it's finally showtime for Tommy and his band with their mission in Memphis. 
This is a dream come true for these Swedish musicians, and they've saved up for it for a long time. It's 9 p.m. Even European rock veterans have to fill up the club, the only thing that matters for the owner. There is no curiosity factor here. You play what the tourists want. And they want one thing more than anything else. Elvis. For his fans, the king still lives on decades after his death in 1977. Since then, Graceland is truly the mecca of the Elvis legend. 600,000 people track out here each year. Only the White House in Washington has more visitors. Elvis was 22 when he bought Graceland, and he spent the remaining 20 years of his life here. This is where the king liked to go for peace and quiet. Elvis is said to have told the few select guests he welcomed here the story about the American president, who wanted to show Graceland to the then Soviet premier Khrushchev as a demonstration of how far a poor boy could rise within the capitalist system. The American dream came true for Elvis' parents. After decades of bitter poverty, they spent their last years in comfort here. As his career began to falter, Elvis took refuge in Graceland, above all in the jungle room, his favorite retreat. Lying on the couch next to the waterfall, he would dream of Hawaii. He also recorded his last songs here. Visitors only get to see what reinforces the Elvis legend. The rooms where the private tragedy of his life played out are closed to the public. We too are only allowed to see a glamorous fantasy world bejeweled by the trophies of his career, gold records and elaborate costumes he often had to starve himself to fit into. Executors of his estate, Elvis Presley Enterprises, are careful not to let anything besmirch Elvis' memory. Here's to the myth. Gibson is also a myth, the chosen instrument of the guitar gods. B.B. King plays a Gibson, as does Clapton and, of course, Keith Richards. Jim Dawson's job is to bring a Gibson guitar to life. He used to tour the country playing in bands, so he knows what to do with a guitar. Eight years ago, at the age of 50, he left the road behind him. Now, Jim is a guitar tester. It took us a long time to get permission to film behind the scenes here. Much of the work invested into the production of these luxury items is still done by hand. This is great. You're making little children that uh, somebody's going to fall in love with. This is what I want to do, so I'm here. Like most of the workers here, Eric Lehman plays rock and blues, combining his job and his hobby. My first guitar was a Gibson. That was quite a while ago. I've had them ever since. I love them. So this is probably a dream, but uh, I don't want to wake up just now. It's got a sound that you can't copy, and it's got a feel when you're, when you're playing it. It feels like no other guitar. It's just a Gibson. It's this warm, fat sound that fans love so much.
only top guitars like the Gibson are manufactured with such attention to detail. Around 50 guitars leave the factory each day. This obsession with detail has its price. A single guitar can cost between $3,000 to $5,000, and sometimes much more. Whether it's worth the money is for Jim to decide when he's made the final adjustments. Once that's done, the sound that will soon be heard on stages and arenas around the world rings out for the very first time. Perhaps a myth like Gibson's is only possible in a city so deeply entrenched in mythology, like that of the magic generated by all the bright lights once the city is encased in darkness. The Cadillac Band have been guests in Memphis now for a week. But their mission is not quite finished yet. On their final evening in town, they head off for a recording session at Sun Studio, where rock and roll history was written. Okay. Recording engineer James Lott works night shifts. During the daytime, the studio is left to the tourists. <coughs> uh, let's see. What are we going to do first, boys and girls? Now these musicians feel almost as if they've traveled back to the time when Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis and Johnny Cash recorded here. For James Lott, above all, the myth is good for business. It's the sound of this room that for 50 years it's been making music. It has seeped into the walls. The Cadillac band seeks inspiration from this sound tonight. This is a moment they've long anticipated. Always thought about the Sun Studio. That's that's why the, well, the big stuff happened, and uh, it's uh, something magic over it. I, I was dreaming about this when I was 10, 12 years old, and I, in some special way, I did know that I would play together with these Elvis musicians. I don't know, cannot cannot explain how we, how I thought I could believe it. But uh, it went exactly as I, I thought and dreamed about. The Cadillac Band has written a new song especially for this evening. Their hymn to Memphis. Fast and seat bells, time to take off. Stock on from Memphis via Amsterdam. Gonna play at Alfred's, Alfred's on Beale Street. And the Cadillac band. Tommy, Ulf, and the rest of their Swedish bandmates bid farewell to Memphis. And we take joy in the legend that comes to mind when you hear the name Memphis. Once a year, people come in droves to the Mississippi River. Memphis is the venue of the annual World Championship Barbecue Cooking Contest. It's all about pigs here. 250 teams have qualified for this year's competition. One of the participants is Craig Blondis, owner of a chain of barbecue restaurants and a real pro. We come down here just to have a good time, cook some barbecue, fellowship, you know, because that's what barbecue's all about. Hanging out, drinking beer, shooting the shit. Pardon my language, but I'm assuming you can say that in Germany. <laughs> but that's basically what it is. It's, it's about fellowship. The festivities in Memphis last for three days. This is far more than just a competition. Barbecue is a testimony to a way of life, a common thread binding all Southerners. 
and those who come from elsewhere get to experience the heartfelt, down-to-earth hospitality of the barbecue culture. European grilling has little to do with the barbecue, as we discover from Jimmy Dots, a veteran competitor here. Everybody here has a, a style that they do. This is a dry rub. You put the rub on it, and you rub it into, you physically rub it into the, into the meat. You let it sit for a period of time, whatever you like, two hours, 20 minutes, whatever. On the grill, hickory smoke, southern style, absolutely. And then I, I flame kiss them, put them directly over the fire, let the flame come up, and just tinge them just a little bit on the edge with a little black, just a little char. Then back off of the heat, indirect heat, and essentially it's just a baking process and for, you, you know, four or five hours, depending on how your grill is, you want the bone just to twist out. That's when it's done. These smokers tenderize what was once regarded as food for the poor. Tough, cheap pork sections like ribs, shoulders, or feet. The smoke adds flavor without expensive seasonings. The Spanish word babacoa refers to a process of cooking in a pit. Caribbean slaves eventually imported the tradition to the plantations in the Deep South. Barbecue has long since established itself nationwide as a competitive discipline. Potential world champions in Memphis have to qualify in local competitions first. Bob Lewis and Jim Penrath have been members of the Crispy Critters team for 28 years. Its members come from different walks of life from all across the USA, and they meet up six times each year. We take the cooking very serious. It's a, it's a good time, but we get very serious when it comes to cooking the hog or cooking whatever entry we're cooking in. It's important for us to try and take first place. That's what we're here for. We like to party, but we're here to win. <laughs> exactly. It looks like the whole city's gathered down at the river. During the competition, the old town center around Main Street looks like a ghost town. It's reminiscent of how it looked 40 years ago, when Memphis once again made history. Those were days of anger, an anger that remains unforgotten. They were days of struggle when black waste disposal workers went on strike, demanding the same pay and working conditions as their white co-workers. These eight weeks shook America to its very core. On April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King comes to town. He's staying at the Lorraine Motel. At around 6 p.m., King, the leader of the civil rights movement, steps out onto the balcony of room 306. Then a shot is fired. King is fatally wounded. Today, the motel is home to the National Civil Rights Museum. The museum preserves the memories of generations of Afro-Americans, memories that leave no one untouched, regardless of their skin color. Memories of a seemingly futile struggle against an oppressive state-sponsored foe. The National Guard was deployed against these non-violent civilian protesters. Some of the museum's visitors were eyewitnesses. I have sometimes anger, sometimes pride, sometimes confusion. Um, actually, a better understanding also when I see it all in one place. I lived through part of this. I've been around a little while. And uh, I didn't understand some of it when, when I was living through it. And looking back at all the pieces together, I think I can appreciate it a little bit better. Lana Bardo has rediscovered the story here of Rosa Parks, the black woman in Montgomery, Alabama, who one day decided to take a seat in the whites-only section of a bus and refused to move. That was 50 years ago, and during that time, much has changed for Lana 
and her son Stephen. My son here that is with us, he's a sports commentator. And um, back during the days when I was a child, he would have never been able to have that kind of a job. It wasn't allowed for that then. As a father, I always want them to understand what it used to be like. It's better now, but what took place for them to be able to have the experiences and the opportunities that they have, a lot of this comes from this experience. So it's very important that we get to see this with our children and my parents. And so it's very special to be here today. For Stephen's mother, Lana, who participated in the March on Washington, as well as for all of black America, the largest demonstration in America's history marked a turning point. At that time, it was still a dream. This dream came true for the man who was two years old at the time and who today is the president of the United States. Obama's election was also the fulfillment of a dream for the Walkins family. It makes you really appreciate yesterday. Because I used to be one of the advocates, why do we keep talking about yesterday? Yesterday was yesterday, today is today. But that's why you have to remember yesterday to appreciate today and, that's why and tomorrow. We brought all these kids out so they could see that whole struggle. Like, I took her to see Obama. Yeah. And so we want them to see this is what we fought for, not me. But my our parents, parents and our, our parents. parents. Yeah. All around the museum, visitors, most of them black, are talking and discussing their impressions. Down on the riverbank, the party mood has been in the air for hours. The Miss Piggy contest is one of the World Championship barbecue cooking contest's highlights. And it's also watched by millions of Americans on television. After hours on the spit, the ribs, shoulders, and half pigs are cooked through. Their aroma hangs heavy over the Mississippi River bank. Now it's a matter of waiting until the jury comes around and passes its judgment. But that's not really the main thing for most folks here. Sociologist and expert on the South, John Shelton Reed says, you want to talk about heritage, not hate. That represents a heritage we all share and can take pride in. Barbecue both symbolizes and contributes to community. What better way for us to say goodbye to Memphis, the city of myths on the Mississippi, than with a party on this mighty river? After a long night and a two-hour drive from Memphis, the U.S. Army awaits us. Today, Mark Manning and Donnie Armstrong are on duty on the Eddy. The entire course of the river is under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. America is unwilling to leave the fate of its lifeline to civilian-run organizations. The ferry links the riverbank with a ferry base in the middle of the Mississippi. We're heading off to board the Hurley, the pride of the Corps of Engineers and its flagship. Mark is one of the officers on board. The dredge Hurley is like a huge vacuum cleaner. Its motor is located in the main ship a 328 feet long, 66 feet wide monstrosity with five decks. The exhaust pipe is more than 980 feet long. The Hurley is in operation around the clock. You see here is our discharge. We're removing the sand from the channel, coming down through the pump, through the pipeline, and then we're placing it up here on the sandbar. That's our spoil area right there. About 3,500 cubic yards per hour. What's your pump? 
The vacuum cleaner has to be cleaned itself every couple of hours. For Captain Frank Seagree, the massive suction head is the main weapon in the battle to keep the river from filling up with sand. It's stuck down almost 16 feet into the riverbed in the last few days, dragging out everything that has been deposited down in the murky waters. The U.S. Congress passed legislation giving the Army Corps a clear mission. Even at its shallowest point, the waterway has to maintain a minimum depth of 9 feet and a minimum width of 300 feet. Victoria Bend is one of the critical spots for towed barge trains like this one, loaded with 30 freight barges transporting more than 30,000 tons of coal. It is a never-ending duel between the captain and the forces of nature. What you see here, is the river used to run down through the Benway of Victoria. This is the way the river used to run the Benway. We put some underwater weirs in here, and they sanded in and filled up. The channel moved back toward the bar. These are dikes. And what we're doing is dredging this lower end off right here. Widening the channel out there and put more water in here so they can bring these bigger toes down through the river system. Down there, we have a tow coming up below us and you can watch him as he comes up through there. He has very little room to navigate. You don't have a chance at all. You miss it the first time, you'll be on the bank tear up. The Hurley can only pursue its tedious mission from June to November, when the Mississippi's waters are low. For all the effort, it actually only involves moving the sand from one place to another. The Hurley has to anchor here each year. The vacuum's machinery runs night and day. Like everyone on the crew, Chief Engineer Michael Barton also works in 12-hour shifts, he spends seven days on board, followed by two or three days of shore leave. Life on the river is quiet. Frank Sigri has been doing it for 23 years. I guess it gets in your, in your life. You don't know anything else but working on the water. Uh, I wouldn't do anything else. On land, I feel like I'm uh, lost. I feel more at home out here on the water. And I think most of my crew is the same way. It's, it's just the love of what we do. John D. Boyd Sr. is perhaps the most important man on board, working twice a day for the 30 men crew who are currently at their posts. John has to serve up something that appeals to all of his countrymen on board, regardless of whether they're from New York or Alaska. Today, he's serving chicken fricassee. If we had been on board yesterday, we could have tasted his speciality, prime rib in a spicy herbal crust. We cooked it for two and a half hours. Then we brown it 30 minutes and serve it, cut the water, or either put it on the line with baked potatoes and sour cream and butter, vegetables and soup and bread. How for a week? Once a week. And we have steak twice a week, Saturdays and Tuesdays. Uh, probably T-bone steak on Saturday and uh, ribeye steak on Tuesday. There aren't too many surprises on the Hurley. Sometimes ships pass by. Captain Frank knows most of the captains and their stories, if only by radio. There's not a large community of us, and we always talk. The strange thing about it is you'll uh, talk to a man for several years before you ever meet him face to face, just passing on the river. And you'll get to know him, his family, but you'll never lay eyes on him until you meet up somewhere. It is kind of strange. We say goodbye then to Captain Frank, the Army Corps and the Hurley, a seemingly unmilitary military world. For a long time, the 
white conquerors accept that the great river is the border to the land of the Indians. Then millions crossed over the Mississippi in the quest for their fortunes. The settlers' tracks are memorialized in St. Louis in the Gateway Arch. But the land along the Mississippi already had a history long before this conquest. Cahokia is the largest settlement of indigenous Americans north of Mexico. Its mounds are visible from St. Louis. Several generations worked to build Monk's Mound, Cahokia's main landmark. It's likely that around 1,000 years ago, a powerful ruler reigned over an expensive realm. Archaeologists estimate that it may have looked something like this. The museum holds Archaeology Day once a year. The demand this year is greater than ever before. Americans increasingly want to know more about who lived on their land long before they did. Bill Eisminger supervises the excavations at Cahokia. He and his fellow archaeologists tell the eager amateurs how old their finds are and what they were used for by their ancient American makers. Press this way and that gives that beveling effect. But it's, it's basically a knife. About 6900 BC, so about 7000 BC or about 9000 years old. And it's been resharpened some. You can see how the, if you look at it from the end, how the edges are beveled again, kind of like I was showing that other person, that kind of beveling or resharpening. So that's almost, that's around almost 9,000 years old. Regardless of how old the artifacts are, it's all finders keepers here. They're finding most of these in farmers' fields in the local area, or sometimes they buy them at auctions or uh, from friends. But uh, when, they're, when they're being found originally, they're usually out in plowed fields that farmers have you know, churned them up where villages and things used to be. So sometimes you'll get a lot of mixture of things. A lot, the same spot may have been used by many different cultures over different time periods. So over 10 to 20,000 years, people lived in this area over and over and over again, just as we're doing today. Some pieces are extraordinary, even for Bill. And it's, um, so it'd be about uh, 800 years old or so. What can these finds from today tell us about the lives of their original owners? The Cahokia Empire was at its peak some 1,000 years ago. But researchers are still puzzled about its rise and fall. I believe that Cahokia grew to the size and importance that it did because of its location near the Mississippi River. Rivers were the highways for the people at that time. That's how they traveled in their dugout canoes over long distances, and we do see good evidence of long distance trade. And the river bottom also was very fertile, which was good for the agriculture. So the resources are very abundant here, and the river provided the transportation route. Cahokia's population left long before the white man arrived. Nobody knows why or where they went. We follow the river, ever further northwards, on today's modern roads. The famed Highway 61 has long since become a legend in its own right as the escape route from a predetermined life. What will those people think who one day dig in the archaeological sites of the future? What will they find out about all the people who traveled before them on and along the Great River, east to west, south to north, white and black, in search of the American dream of wealth, freedom and happiness? North
north of St. Louis, the flatlands give way to an idyllic scene. Gently rolling hills accompany us to our final destination. L.A. Seuss has been playing on the river for more than 20 years, originally on real steamboats. Today he's entertaining guests on an excursion boat. The Mark Twain is named after the Mississippi's most famous captain, although he actually only did the job for a couple of years. That was, of course, before he became America's most popular author. Hannibal is his hometown. Mark Twain described this view as one of the finest on the Mississippi. He grew up over 170 years ago as Samuel Langhorne Clements, only a stone's throw away from the riverbank. The fence is familiar to anyone who's ever read the story of Tom Sawyer. Twain left the family home nearby at the age of 18 to never return. But in his memories, it was transfigured into Tom's home, and Twain's pen transformed his monotonous childhood into a world of adventure. Hannibal proudly calls itself America's hometown. Everywhere you're confronted with Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, Becky Thatcher and their stories. In Search of Tom Sawyer. An excursion into MacDougall's cave, as Twain called it, in describing Becky and Tom's daring exploration adventure, is only possible today with a guide like Erica. Erica knows the cave labyrinth like the back of her own hand. We pass by the treasure chest that made Tom and Huck rich. We dare to go down deeper. This must be where Tom and Becky get hopelessly lost. And here's where they narrowly escaped falling into the hands of the gruesome Injun Joe. Erica knows where the secret exit is that enabled Twain's duo to escape. The story has a happy end, also for Hannibal. The town lives from the legend of its proudest son. Banjo player L.A. Seuss found his niche here after years as a traveling musician. I was getting old. I wasn't going to be a rocker. <laughs> you know, so let's step back in time and uh, appreciate the simplicity of one instrument uh, on, a, on a beautiful place like a riverboat on the, um, you know, sitting in the sunset. It's not a bad life. <laughs> Here's a song called The Mississippi Sawyer. Hannibal is a veritable open air museum, the perfect place for Americans in search of a life in the so called good old days. Richard Gary chose a rundown old barn as the place for his very own journey back in time. He worked for decades as an actor on the road, but here in this small town in the Mississippi, he found his calling. Hannibal is very typically American. It's, uh, it still has some of that frontier mentality. This was the Wild West in Mark Twain's day. When he was a boy, uh, this was uh, like Dodge City became later on. 
So it's very rough and tumble. You have an opportunity to succeed, but it's your own wits and your own ability, and no one is going to pick you up. True to his creed, Richard Gary transforms himself into his alter ego every day. For years, he worked through his writings, dramatized them, and listened meticulously to old records to get Mark Twain's manner of speech just right. He even adopted Twain's quirk of introducing himself in the third person. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to present a man whose great learning and veneration for truth are exceeded only by his high moral character and majestic presence. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Twain, a humorist who is really funny. I love to walk through Hannibal at night. When the darkness settles in, you catch that feeling of time passing away and being here in those old days. In Hannibal, it really does seem as if time stands still on the banks of the Mississippi, North America's mightiest river. Mississippi very much influences the people that live along it and always have from the very beginning. Someone has written that there would never have been a United States of America without the Mississippi River. It's the gateway to the West. It opened up the, all of the interior of the country and it puts its stamp on everyone. America is rediscovering the Mississippi, its lifeblood all over again. Once a year, tens of thousands of people gather in Memphis on the banks of Old Man River. The Sunset Symphony pays tribute to the Mississippi, this year with Smetana's The Moldau. One evening and one whole night, all in celebration of a river.